folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri, and head of Prophetic Research Ministry with another Watchman video broadcast. Actually, this is going to be a, a sort of a unique and a different a Watchman broadcast, something different than what we normally do here on this broadcast. Uh, God showed me something this morning that when I saw it, that the hairs just raised up on the back of my neck. And I hope and I think that when I show you what I've got to show you today, uh, you're going to see something in a whole new light today. We're going to talk about, instead of us just giving news and current events and things that are going on in the church and some of the wacky stuff that Todd Bentley's doing this week, we're going to look at something that uh, I, I think will be interesting to us. And I think that it's something, as I was praying about this, I think and I hope that it's something that God wanted us to know something that God wanted us to see, something He wanted us to understand about what's going on in the days that we're living in right now. You know, one of the things that I, that I don't do in this ministry is that I don't set dates. I don't say, well, you know, the stars are going to align here, and this is going to happen in the Middle East, and then that's going to be the rapture, and, and it's going to happen, you know, July 14th, you know. I don't do that in this ministry, but I will tell you that I believe that two things are going on. Number one, we are absolutely seeing an unfolding of the very pages of the Word of God right in front of our very eyes in the days that you and I are living in. The second thing is we also see an unfolding of our understanding of what this book is about and what it says and how it reveals things that are prophetic for us in the last days. We're going to be talking about the Antichrist, the beast. No, I don't, I don't know who it is. I don't think it's Barack Obama. I don't think it's Henry Kissinger. I don't think it's Yasser Arafat, although it could be because he's dead now. I'm pretty sure it's not me, and I don't think it's you either. But let's look at some clues. Let's look at some ideas, some understandings that I think God wants us to see and that understanding is going to come from two places. The primary source that we're going to look at today will be our King James Bibles. The other source that we're going to look at are things that are out in this world. You know, we're going to use the Bible as glasses to see really what's going on in this world. And we're going to talk about the beast, the Antichrist. And if those of you who have never heard anything like this before, let me introduce you to him via the scriptures. Revelation chapter 13 verse 1. Here is John the apostle and he's talking about a vision that God gave him concerning things that were going to happen in the last days. John said, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now we know who that dragon is. We know that the dragon is Lucifer himself. That is identified for us in Revelation 12, and we'll see that here in a little bit. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded, to death. Now, if you have seen uh, any of our previous videos, any of the teaching that we have put out here uh, on how to understand the Bible as a prophetic word, you know that there are word symbols given to us in the scriptures and things that sort of draw pictures in our mind. They're called simil similitudes in the Bible. They're called typology or in samples or examples. They're even called shadows in the New Testament of things that are going to take place. So I want you to think in the Bible as you read some of this stuff, and we won't get into nearly all of this in this video or in this broadcast, but it says, I saw in one of his heads as it were wounded to death. So I want you to kind of think in your mind of Bible stories where someone was wounded in their head. And for that matter, because I kind of know what I've got coming out later on this year, you might want to think of something historical, maybe something that has happened in this country that relates to someone receiving a deadly wound in their head. Think about it, all right? But anyway, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war? with him. So I want you to understand that, number one, this beast rises up. I want you to get this picture. John is looking out over the sea. The sea is often a picture in the Bible of the underworld, what lies underneath it. 
And so here's John, he's standing on the sand of the sea, and he sees this beast rise up out of the sea. You've heard that name before, the beast, 666 and all that stuff. That's who this is talking about, and that's who we're dealing with here. And it says that he had, in one of his heads, he had a deadly wound, which caused his death, and then that wound was healed, and so he was alive, was killed, and he's going to be brought back to life one of these days. May have already taken place, I don't know, but it will happen one of these days for sure. We also see that this, um, this beast causes everyone to not only worship the beast, but worship the dragon, which gave his power unto the beast. So anyway, so I want you to get this picture here. Here we have a beast rising up out of the sea. The Antichrist, John calls him, rising up out of the sea. We're going to further identify or understand a little bit of his characteristics. Looking in Revelation chapter 13, verse 5, the Bible says, And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now, it's really interesting because the other night in our church service, we were talking about this here. And uh, I was talking about, I don't know, you know, sometimes I'll chase rabbits here, there, and everywhere. And we were talking about uh, this idea of the number six and the number seven. And I was asking, you know, what the number six meant. The number six is the number for man. The creation of man took place on the sixth day. And in Genesis chapter six, go study Genesis chapter six if you want to get a further understanding of what this beast really is all about, what makes him what he is. The number six would then be the number for man. The number seven, obviously, in the Bible, and you can look at various places, is the number for God. So here we have, now watch this. I'm going to show you a verse here in Matthew chapter 1, verse 17. We believe that Jesus not only is the Son of God, but He is God in the flesh. He literally was both God and man at the same time. In Matthew chapter 1, we have a lineage of Christ given. And then in verse 17, there is a summation of that lineage. I want you to notice. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away unto Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. If you add those up, that's 42 generations. From Abraham to Jesus Christ, that is a multiple of six and seven. And here we have this idea that Jesus is fully man and yet fully God. So we go back then to Revelation chapter 13. We see that the Antichrist is sort of the antithesis of everything that Jesus is. He is his exact opposite. Jesus comes down from heaven. The beast rises up from the sea, or we'll see later on, the bottomless pit. Very important for you to remember that as we move forward in this. So the Antichrist, the beast, is the antithesis of Jesus Christ. He is his exact opposite here. And here we have the beast who is allowed to continue 40 and 2 months. Here again, that is a multiple of 6 times 7. 6 for the number of man, 7 for the number of gods or God himself. Remember the dragon has seven heads and this beast has seven heads, indicating you to you his source, where he's from, what he really is. He is the fusion of men and the gods together. Again, go back to Genesis chapter 6 for that. And by the way, we're talking about the number 6. What is his number? 600, 3 score, and 6. Now I'm going to go back to this idea in Revelation 13 of this beast being rising up from the sea or rising up from the lower parts of the earth or the deep as it's called in various places in the scripture. Um, the bottomless pit where we're going to see later. So it says in Revelation 13, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. The parallel to this is in Daniel chapter 7. And here's, this is interesting. I like this. Here we have the book of Daniel. It's the 27th book of the Old Testament. And here we have the book of Revelation. It's the last book in the New Testament. There are 27 books in the New Testament. So that makes, let's see, Revelation, the 27th book of the New Testament. That's a perfect match. None shall want her mate, Isaiah says, when he's talking about seeking you out the book of the Lord. None shall want her mate. So we have, uh, we have two witnesses here, one in Revelation, the 27th book of the New Testament. Then we go to the 27th book of the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, and notice what Daniel says. 
Daniel spake, and I said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. And then he speaks in verse 7 of this fourth beast. And here we're going to see the similarities between this and the beast that John saw in the book of Revelation chapter 13. After this I saw in the night vision, to behold a fourth beast. The number four always points you to the spiritual kingdoms or the spiritual world. Paul said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. The four things here. Um, so anyway, the number four points you to that spiritual realm. After this, in the book of Daniel chapter 2, we're given the vision of the four kingdoms. It's the fourth kingdom that we concentrated on heavily in this ministry because God is showing us that this fourth kingdom that mingles themselves, here it is, with the seed of men, that fourth kingdom is not from this world. It is from the spiritual realms. So here Daniel says, in Daniel 7, verse 7, After this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So Daniel seeing this image, John saw this image of this future world king that's going to conquer the entire earth, 42 months, multiple of six and seven, and we see where his source is. He does, he's not Jesus in that he does not descend from, from heaven. He comes up from the abyss or the pit or the sea. Revelation chapter 17 the Bible gives us further details about this. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not. The Bible is telling you that he used to be, and now he's dead, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. Revelation chapter 11 verse 7, the Bible again describes this beast in the same manner. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So here we have this beast, and we see, we've, I mean, we've, all the things we've seen so far, it's telling us that this beast, he's coming up out of a pit, and one of the major things that he does is that he immediately does not like God's people. He hates their guts, and he'll stop at nothing to destroy them. He's going to try to, he's going to, try to conquer over the entire planet. He stamps down things, and he breaks things in pieces. He is responsible for destroying all of the old world systems by breaking them in pieces so that he can put them together in in his own fashion going from the old world order to a new world order. Have you heard of that term before? New world order. That's what it's referring to. It's the kingdom of this beast, the Antichrist, in the last days. And the first thing that he has to do, for the first thing he's got to do, he's got to get rid of the two witnesses which are epitomized in the scriptures as the Old and the New Testament. Out of the mouth of two witnesses shall every word be established. But here he's got to, he's got to get rid of the witnesses. He's got to remove everything out of his way that impedes him. And he'll break down and destroy and tear apart everything so that he can rebuild it in his own image, in his own fashion. I want you to think of 9-11, September 11th, 2001 that old, the old structures of the World Trade Towers being destroyed, and now we're building a new one in its place. There's a tarot card about that. We've talked about that in some of our other videos. The Babel Conspiracy is one of them. But anyway, so I want you to get this. So now, right now, the beast, I believe, he's locked inside of the pit. And we're going to find out here in a little bit how it is that he got here. We're going to go all through the scriptures and see this. So right now, he is in the pit. He is in the bottomless pit. And he's locked away there. How is it that he gets out? 
I believe that God is going to let him out in the last days. He is going to be the summation of every evil thing that's ever existed on the earth. It's, it's almost like all of the sins of mankind are birthing this Antichrist. You know, that's, that's, an, that's an interesting concept because birth water, the water that's inside the womb of a woman, and seawater are practically the same. They have the same salinity factor, salt water. Okay, So get that imagery. This Antichrist literally coming up out of the sea, he's being birthed out. Think of this verse in the book of James. Lust, when it hath conceived, bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The Bible calls this beast the man of sin, the son of perdition. So all of these birthing terms in the Bible that Peter talked about in the last days, that when they shall say peace and safety, then what? Sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. So get all of these images in your mind. So he's in the pit now. He's locked up in there. How does he get out? God's going to allow him to come out and he's going to use his great agent of evil in the earth to facilitate this. Revelation chapter 9. I want you to notice this. We're going to look at numbers. We're going to look at symbols. We're going to look at words. We're going to see how this event takes place. Revelation chapter 9. And the fifth angel sounded. There's the number five there. Hang on to that. We're going to see it in a minute. And I saw a star fall from heaven. You remember the verse in Isaiah. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? The King James Bible says Lucifer. That's Satan, the dragon, the devil. So here he falls from heaven. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Verse 3. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. I want you to think about these scorpions for a minute. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. So here, we see this imagery here of, I believe, Lucifer falling from heaven. Remember, he is the fallen angel. How art thou fallen from heaven? He is falling from heaven. Uh, he is represented as a star. Stars are angels in the Bible. He falls from heaven. He has the key given to him. He didn't steal it. Who is it that had the key before him? It was Jesus Christ. He's the one that owns the keys to hell and death. And so he is given the key, he falls from heaven, he unlocks the pit, and out of this pit comes this demonic horde. Now some scholars say, do these are Apache attack helicopters? Don't believe that. Let's believe the Bible. I guarantee you, you'll get more enlightenment by following the Bible than you will following Apache attack helicopters. Okay, Even if black helicopters are swarming around our secret broadcast compound right now at 1233 American Legion Drive, Festus, Missouri, let's focus on what's coming out of this pit and what the Bible says about it. So here what they have, they have, they're given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And then look at Revelation chapter 9. Verse 10, it said, they had tails like unto scorpions. I'm going to stop right here because I like this. And I want you to think about this for a minute. The uh, last part of the book of Mark, chapter 16, verses uh, 9 through, uh, I think it's uh, 21. Uh, by the way, those verses are missing out of a lot of Bibles. Now, they'll, put them, they'll print them in like in the NIV and the Message Bible and things like that, but they'll put a note on there that says, we don't think these verses belong in here. It's interesting that they say that because it's in those verses where Jesus is giving final instructions to his disciples, and, he's, and he tells them, he said, you shall tread on scorpions. You'll have power over the enemy. So it's just amazing that they want to take these verses out of the Bible. I think there's something wrong with that. But anyway, and they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men. Here's this number again. Five months. Hang on to that. We're going to see it in a minute. And they had a king. 
over them, which is the angel. Now, get this now. He is an angel. It is the angel of the bottomless pit. Now, I want you to notice this. This is Revelation chapter 9, verse 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. And so, here we have this idea. So, first of all, we see a revelation that this beast is going to rise up out of the pit. We know that he's in the pit now. We know what he is. It's not a man. Okay, That's why it's not Barack Obama and Henry Kissinger or Ronald Reagan or anybody else. This is an angel. How did that angel get into this pit to begin with? Here again, the King James Bible reveals to us how he got in there to begin with. How did he, how did he get locked up in what the Bible refers to as the prison? 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Jude says almost the identical thing. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. This angel and these, these other angels, this demonic horde that's rising up out of the pit, out of the prison, out of their chains that they were in, were placed there by God because God put them in jail because these are the angels that sinned. These are the angels that you'll find named the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 and they left their habitation uh, which was and their and their um, their estate. They left their habitation and their state. Uh, in that angels are not supposed to marry or mingle with human women. But that is exactly what happened in Genesis chapter six. And so they did this thing, and God cast them into prison, and they've been held there all of this time, buried in the in the abode of the dead, the grave, the pit, the prison, the abyss, the bottomless pit under the sea. I want you to get all of this imagery here because we have a, a typological story. This is neat. This is going to, this is going to knock your, knock your, put your socks on so this will knock your socks off. Okay. We have stories of this in the, in the Bible, stories of, uh, in, in, in human form of what happened when these angels and, and when they sinned and what was their judgment and what happened to them. We're going to go back to the book of Joshua chapter 10. If you can hear the excitement in my voice and see my mannerisms today, this was a, a, a what I'm going to show you later. Some of this stuff I've known for years, and God is just piecing it together today. I came in this morning not really planning on doing anything, and God put this thing together for me in about three hours, and I'm, I'm giving it to you today. Joshua chapter 10. Joshua is fighting the battles for the promised land, okay? The promised land is a picture of heaven. And some say, well, you know, the promised land is really not heaven because there are no wars in heaven. Yes, there is. Revelation chapter 12, we'll see it in a minute, okay? But here is Joshua, and he's fighting the wars for the promised land. In Joshua chapter 10, you remember this, this day when the sun stood still and the moon did not move, so it lengthened the day so that Joshua could kill his enemies? Notice what the Bible says about these enemies. Joshua chapter 10 verse 14, and there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened in the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. And Joshua returned and all Israel with him unto the camp to Gilgal, but these five kings, remember the fifth trumpet, remember the five months, these five kings fled and hid themselves in a cave at Makeda. And it was told Joshua, saying, the five kings are found hid in a cave at Makeda. So I want you to think of things that are below the ground, underground. Think images out of the Bible, like a pit, or a cave, or a well. Think of these images in the Bible as we move on. Now, Joshua chapter 10, verse 18, the Bible says, And Joshua said, Roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave and set men by it for to keep them. So here we have this, again, this imagery. God has placed his, this king of the bottomless pit, Abaddon, the beast, into the pit with all of those 
scorpion-like angels. They're down under the earth right now. They're in a pit. They're locked up in a cave. And this is what Joshua did. He set a stone. He set stones upon the mouth of the cave so that they could not get out. But look what happens in Joshua chapter 10. And I like this, verse 22. Did you know the number 22 is the number for revelation or things being opened up or things being revealed? How many chapters in the book of Revelation? There's 22 there. It's a revealing. Now watch this. God's going to reveal something to you. Joshua chapter 10 verse 22. Then Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. And they did so and brought forth those five kings unto him out of the mouth of the cave. By the way, now we're in verse 23. 23 has everything to do with the number of chromosomes where our DNA is stored. You need to watch that video again so you understand the number 23. And what happens when these kings, this event, Revelation chapter 9, takes place? It has everything to do with them mingling themselves with the seed of men. And they did so and brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. Now notice what happened. And it came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. I'm going to stop right here. I, I like this. Uh, because remember what I told you all ago is that these kings, these devils, these demons, these angels, they look like scorpions. And what did Jesus say in Mark chapter 16? He told his disciples, he said, I will give you power to tread on scorpions. And here, Joshua is telling his captains, go over there, lay these guys down on the ground, and put your feet on the necks. They were treading on these scorpion kings. Mm, I love this. Put your feet upon the necks of these kings. By the way, wasn't there a movie called The Scorpion King? Sorry to throw that in there. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. The Bible says that Jesus must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And remember, these scorpions have the sting of death. They have the power of death during that five-month period. These five kings. I like this. How did Jesus defeat his enemies? Look at Joshua chapter 10, verse 26. And afterward, Joshua smote them and slew them and hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging upon the trees until the evening. And it came to pass at the time of the going down of the sun that Joshua commanded and they took them down off the trees and cast them into the cave wherein they had been hid and laid great stones in the cave's mouth, which remain until this very day. The Bible tells us that Jesus made a show of his enemies while he was on the cross. Look at this story. Here we have Christ hanging on a tree, becoming a curse for us, but he's also showing the defeat of this army that's in the pit right now. And he's hanging on a tree until the time of the going down of the sun. They take him down off of the tree. They put him where? in a cave. And they rolled gr a great stone in the front of that cave. I like this. The defeat of this army is not in my power or your power. It's in the cross of Jesus Christ. So those guys are locked up right now in the heart of the earth in a pit, in a cave. And they're still sealed in there until the time when the fifth trumpet sounds and that key is going to open them up in the last days. Here's another picture of this. I want you to get this imagery. Exodus chapter 14, verse 8. You remember when Israel is coming out of Egypt and going into the promised land. What happened? Before they got there, they had an encounter at the Red Sea. What happened with them? Here they are backed up to the Red Sea, and then God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Well, notice what the Bible says, Exodus 14, verse 8. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Pharaoh is a type and a picture of this beast. Have you ever seen these images of Pharaoh? He's got this like snake coming out of his forehead right where the mark of the beast goes. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, listen to that, because I'm going to show you that, and his horsemen, 
Revelation chapter 6, and his army, and overtook them in camping by the sea beside Piahiroth before Baal Zephon. Did you notice the underlying words in that passage? Horses, chariots, and kings, and army. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 9, and the shapes of the locusts, this is that horde that comes out of the pit. The shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads was as it were crowns like gold, their kings, and their faces were as the faces of men. Can I stop right here and tell you that not only did our Savior tell us that we would have power to tread upon scorpions, He also tells us in the scriptures to never be afraid of the faces of men. Don't be afraid, people, when you see the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women. I'm going to show you that in a minute. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Go read Joel. And the army of Joel has lion's teeth, all right? And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. It's the iron kingdom mingling themselves with the seed of men in Daniel chapter 2. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running into battle. Now go back to Exodus chapter 14, verse 27. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. And there remained not so much as one of them. Do you get that imagery there? If, if Pharaoh then is a picture of this, this demonic army in Revelation chapter 9, then watch what happens to Pharaoh. He is, he is shut up by the sea. He's buried. He is down there. He is defeated. He is dead. He's going to rise up again one of these days out of that sea. The beast, the Antichrist coming in the last days. Here is another picture of this embedded for us in the pages of the King James Bible. By the way, you, you can try all you want to. You will not get teaching and depth of understanding like this from any other English translation of the Bible. It just, the language is so messed up, you will never get it. Do you remember the story of the son of David? Not Jesus. Another son of David who wants to steal the throne away from his father. His name is Absalom. And what do we know about Absalom? Absalom had the face of a man, but he had the long hair of a woman. And what happens to him eventually as he's trying to steal the throne of his father David and doesn't succeed and he's fleeing, watch this, he's riding on a horse, Pharaoh, Revelation chapter 6, the horse and his rider. Moses sang about that immediately after the destruction of Pharaoh. He calls him the horse and his rider. Revelation chapter 6, we see the horse and his rider. Now here we have Absalom, a man riding on a horse with the face of a man and long hair as a woman. And what happens? His hair gets tangled in a tree. And what is he doing? He's hanging there from a tree. The Bible says, cursed is anyone who hangeth from a tree. And there, when he's on that tree, he is smote. 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 15 and 10. Young men that bear Joab's armor compassed about and smote Absalom and slew him. The 10 is the number for the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 17 says, And they took Absalom and cast him where? Into a great pit in the wood. And laid a very great heap of stones upon him, and all Israel fled, every one to his tent. Look at the similarity, look at the amazing things that we see out of our King James Bible. So here we have, I want you to get this imagery now because we're going to add to it. This idea and concept, here we have the beast, he's, he's buried, he's in a pit, he's in the abyss. I keep saying that, and I keep saying that for a reason. He's in the bottomless pit, under the sea, buried, dead. A key is going to come down from heaven and it's going to unlock that pit so he can rise out and do what he's going to do to planet earth. Try to destroy the church, try to destroy the Bible. 
and to stamp and stomp out and destroy the earth so he can rebuild it as the kingdom of Lucifer in the last days. Now I'm going to show you another side to this. Revelation chapter 12. Remember that war that we talked about. The war in the promised land was a picture of the war that takes place in heaven. Revelation chapter 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. Remember, I want you to think about this. Because in Joel chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 2, because they're parallel stories, the Bible talks about on the day that the Holy Ghost is poured out on the earth that there shall be, watch this now, signs in the heavens signs in the heavens. And everybody's going, oh, the UFOs are going to come. That's going to be the signs. Here's the sign that you'll see in the heaven. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, remember the birth pangs, uh, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And verse 4, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. That's Jesus uh, in the last days. And she brought forth, notice it's number five, I like this, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up into God. Did you know that's the same two words that's used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where the Bible says we shall be caught up together with them, the dead in Christ, uh, to meet the Lord in the air. It's the same language here in the King James Bible. So I believe this is referring to the rapture and the joining together of the body of Christ with Jesus in the last days. I love it. I absolutely love it. And who's trying to destroy this child as soon as it takes place. Who's trying to do that? The dragon. As soon as it's born, he's trying to destroy. What happened in the days of Moses? They were trying to destroy the Savior Moses before he, as soon as he was born. What happened in the days when Jesus came the first time? Herod said, kill all the Jewish boys. Kill them all. Two years, two years old and younger. Kill them all. I cannot have a king taking my place. I must rule. Herod was a picture of the Antichrist. And so here we have the same thing right here. Now I want you to get this because Revelation chapter 12 verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Now I want you to, I want you to understand this. We have this thing with the number five showing us this event where these, these beasts are rising up out of the earth or out from the sea. Then we have this same imagery given to us where we see the devil and his angels falling from heaven, being cast out from heaven to the earth. So I want you to understand this, that in this day we're going to have a flood of iniquity upon the earth. That flood is going to come up from the heart of the earth, the abyss, and the other source is it's going to fall down from heaven with Lucifer and one-third of the angels that are cast down with him uh, from heaven and to the earth. I'm going to show you a symbol up on the screen. It is the Masonic square and compass. I want you to notice that this symbol has one object, the compass, that points up as if something is rising up, and the square pointing down as if something is coming down up and down. I want you to get that imagery here. It's referred to in various places. Here you see a triangle pointing up. This is on a uh, building in, I think, in Madrid, Spain. A triangle pointing up, a triangle pointing down. It shows the kingdom that's coming in the last days that their source is from two places, rising up out of the earth and falling down from heaven. I, I like this. This image is given to us in the Louvre, you know, that art museum in Paris, France, where you have the blade and the chalice represented. If you watched the movie The Da Vinci Code, you saw this in there. And I want you to notice that here we have a pyramid pointing up and a pyramid pointing down. But I want you to notice that they're different, that the pyramid pointing up is solid. It's from the earth. The pyramid pointing down is sort of like glass or see-through or spiritual. It is falling down. And it shows the joining together 
of these two. Now watch this now, because I, I mentioned this, that the Bible always, if you go read through the book of Psalms, which incidentally, you know, five months, that's 150 days, and you'll see that the Psalms number how many chapters? 150. And all through the Psalms, you'll see the floods coming up, the floods rising up, the floods of ungodly men in the last days. That's what this is referring to. So in Genesis chapter 7, we're going to look at the flood. And I want you to notice, what was the source of the water that destroyed the earth in those days? In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day, were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Two sources for the water. It came up from the ground and it came down from the heaven. That is a picture of what happens in the last days. Verse 12 says, And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Anytime you have a number like four, forty, four hundred, or four thousand, you're looking at a picture of spiritual kingdoms. For we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places, and Daniel's fourth kingdom, and the fourth beast rising up out of the sea. That's what that's a picture of. Now notice this. Because in Genesis chapter 7, it tells you exactly how long this water covered or prevailed upon the earth. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. That's five months. That's the number of chapters in the book of Psalms where it talks about the floods coming over the, the floods of ungodly men in the last days. And remember what our Savior said, Matthew 24, 37, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. We're seeing the future in the past according to the King James Bible. Now I'm going to take you some different places, and I'm going to show you this, this object of things pointing up or pointing down. You remember the book and then the movie called The Da Vinci Code. Notice how they stylize the name Da Vinci uh, in the movie trailer or in the movie itself of the Da Vinci Code. Notice you have the blade and the chalice pointing up and pointing down that shows you the source of the floods of ungodliness in the last days. The Da Vinci Code was based upon the work of the paintings of Leonardo da Vinci centering upon his painting of the Last Supper. And here we have Jesus and Mary Magdalene sitting together and their body outline structure shows you the blade and the chalice. The kingdom of ungodliness in the last days coming up from the earth, coming down from the heavens. If you remember in the movie and in the book, The Da Vinci Code, it centered upon, now get this, it centered upon Rosalind Chapel, built by the Knights Templar, built by the, um, uh, the progenitors of Freemasonry in the world right now. And uh, Rosalind Chapel was always intended to be a sort of an appearance of Solomon's temple. And so Robert Langdon and uh, Sefi Novu uh, in The Da Vinci Code go into Rosalind Chapel because they're looking for a secret a treasure, a hidden treasure. And when he opens the cryptex in the Da Vinci Code, it says, the Holy Grail neath the ancient Roslyn waits, the blade and chalice guarding o'er her gates. And so you remember, they go, to, go down, they go down below Roslyn Chapel into a staircase that has the sign of these two triangles, one pointing up and one pointing down and they go down beneath the earth into a hidden secret chamber underground. And that's where the secret is revealed to Langdon that this woman that he's been accompanying all this time is the secret. She's the mystery. She is the guardian of the secrets of the last day. So here we have underground this buried treasure. Did you see the movie National Treasure? Did you see that? Because National Treasure was about a secret, a treasure, a map that pointed them to a church, but not just a church, Trinity Church. And there we have the symbol of the Tricatcher or the Triple Helix. We talk about that in one of our videos called the Triple Helix. And it's way, 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 way down deep in a buried hidden secret chamber. And remember, they couldn't just walk through a passageway to get to this chamber. It was locked, sealed by stones, and that lock required a key to open it. 
You remember what was said at the beginning of the movie, National Treasure. They uncovered this little scroll and they unscrolled it, sort of like DNA is a scroll with words in it. They unscrolled this saying and it was written, the legend writ, the stain affected, the key in silence undetected, 55 an iron pen. Now, this is funny because in the movie National Treasure, they lead you to believe that there were 55 signers of the Declaration of, iron, uh, Declaration of Independence written in iron pen. That's not true. History tells us that there are actually 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. Google that if you want. What was the 55 in iron pen referring to and what did it have to do with the key that's going to unlock the treasure? The iron pen, Job chapter 19. Job said, oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. Well, guess what, Job? They were. And then he says that they were graven with an iron pen. The phrase iron pen refers to the scriptures, the Bible, where the secret is. The key to unlocking the secret is in the Bible. And what does the number 55 have to do with it? I will tell you that in your King James Bible, the name Satan is found exactly 55 times in the King James Bible. 55 written in iron pen. And here we have Satan. You remember this movie called Starman? Here it is, an ET, an extraterrestrial, an angel falling to the earth, and he's giving this woman a child who's going to be birthed on the earth and he's going to be a great teacher. This is Lucifer. This is the devil who falls. He is the star falling when the fifth angel sounds his trumpet. He's falling to the earth and he has the key in his hand. This is absolutely amazing. Here's something else I found just today while researching this. You remember in the movie National Treasure, they were looking for the, the next key. And they were looking for the next code or the next thing. They had done the thing with the um, Declaration of Independence and the silence, do good letters and all of that stuff. And they were looking at the back of a, I think it was a $10 bill or $100 bill or something like that. They were looking at the back of that, of that money because they were looking at the bell tower there of Independence Hall in Philadelphia. And they noticed that there was a certain time that they had to be there. And the, the, the time on the clock showed 2.22. But you remember, I think it was uh, the guy named Riley in there that spoke up and said, hey, I know something that you don't. Because they thought they had already missed it. And, and he said back then they didn't have daylight savings time. So the time would actually be 3.22. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Get my pun? The symbol for the Skull and Bones Society, you know, that George Bush and George Bush and John Kerry and all these other guys belong to, is a skull and a crossbones. We talked about that in several videos that we've done, but their secret number is 322. This brings us to things that we've been working on here in this ministry for the last few months. Dan Brown's lost symbol. The lost symbol is another way of referring to the lost key or the lost word of Freemasonry. Here is a quote. I want you to listen to this. Here is a quote now from Dan Brown's The Lost Symbol. A formal invitation had just been delivered. Someone was summoning Langdon to unlock a mystical portal that would unveil a world of ancient mysteries and hidden knowledge. And I want you to think about this because at this time now, Langdon is in the Capitol building. He's in the, the rotunda where he's looking up at the apotheosis of George Washington. Literally, man and God mingled together. That's what the apotheosis is. And he's being told, he's looking at a sacred symbol there in the Capitol rotunda on the floor. It's the symbol called the hand of the mysteries. Here is a picture of the hand of the mysteries. I want you to notice that we have a hand. And so when we have a hand, we have a number. One, two, three, four, five. Revelation chapter 9, the fifth angel sounds, the, five, the fifth trumpet, the five months, the five kings. It's all part of it, people. And notice that three of the fingers are pointing upward and two of them are pointing downward. This gives you the as above, so below sign or the, what we now know to be the sign of where these kingdoms are going to come from. Some are going to rise up 
some are going to come down. But Langdon discovers that he now has the key to a mystical portal where a world of ancient mysteries and hidden knowledge is to be found. If we go back to Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper from the Da Vinci Code, we see here one of the disciples giving that exact same sign. Fingers pointing upward, fingers pointing downward. That's the key to unlock the mystery showing where these kingdoms come from. And then later on, Langdon talks about what's called the verbum significatium, which basically means the significant word or the lost word of Freemasonry. Notice what is said here. The girl looked hesitant, but she cleared her throat and continued. According to legend, the sages who encrypted the ancient mysteries long ago left behind a key of sorts, a password that could be used to unlock the, un the encrypted secrets. This magical password, known as the verbum signification, is said to hold the power to lift the darkness and unlock the ancient mysteries, opening them to all human understanding. Solomon smiled wistfully. Ah, yes, the verbum signification. He stared into space for a moment and then lowered his eyes again to the blonde girl. And where is this wonderful word now? The girl looked apprehensive, clearly wishing she had not challenged their guest speaker. She finished reading. Legend holds that the verbum signification is buried deep underground and where it waits patiently for a pivotal moment in history, a moment when mankind can no longer survive without the truth knowledge, and wisdom of the ages. At this dark crossroads, mankind will at last unearth the Word and herald in a wondrous new age of enlightenment. The lost Word basically is written in the same way that uh, Manley Hall wrote The Secret Teachings of All Ages. In fact, most of the lost Word was based upon that. Written in the same style that Albert Pike wrote Morals and Dogma. It was intended to lead you close to the secret, but not actually reveal it itself. But here it is. There, he's summing up everything that all the mystery religions believed. And that is, is that buried deep underground, there is a secret, the lost word. And I want you to understand this, uh, this lost word thing. I'm going to show it to you here in a minute. He talks about the word being buried underground, a key needing to open it up and unlock it, and so that it can come out and bless all of mankind. And if you've read the story, the lost symbol, Langdon ends up at the most significant monument in Washington, D.C., that of Washington's Monument an obelisk or bale shaft. The imagery here with the reflecting pool shows you the as above, so below symbol. One pointing up, one pointing down in the reflecting pool, showing you the source of these two kingdoms in the last days. At the top of Washington's monument, the illuminated capstone, sort of like on the back of a one dollar bill. This capstone weighs exactly 3,300 pounds. 33, the most sacred number in all Freemasonry. We talk about that in depth in several of our videos before you can contact us or other ministries that are carrying that and get a copy of that video. But this capstone at the top, and I want you to get this imagery here because Dan Brown reveals in the lost symbol that buried underground, the, cap, the, um, the cornerstone of Washington's monument it's not actually, you cannot go to Washington's Monument and look around the outside edges for, for the, uh, the cornerstone. It's not there, right there at ground level. It's buried deep underground. And inside of this cornerstone of Washington's Monument, buried deep in the ground, is a Masonic Bible. The symbol for the lost word of Freemasonry. The lost word of Freemasonry, and I want you to get this. Jesus is the revealed, found, discovered Word of God. The Antichrist, then, is the lost, concealed, buried, hidden Word. The Antichrist, the opposite. Jesus speaking is, is the Word of God, the key in silence. Silence is the opposite of speaking. I want you to get this imagery because that's exactly what is revealed in the lost symbol is that this Bible in this cornerstone buried underneath Washington's monument is a symbol of the beast locked away in the pit. But one of these days, and Langdon shows you this symbolism because what he does is, is that he ascends up to the top of Washington's monument via 
a spiral staircase, a winding staircase, something, you know, that looks like DNA. And he ascends up to the top to the point of illumination or godhood. This is the same thing that's given to us in the symbolism of the Eastern mystic practice called Kundalini. Kundalini teaches that at the base, the bottom, buried, hidden, the base of your spine is a coiled up serpent. Remember the beast gets his power from the serpent, the dragon. At the base of your spine is a coiled up serpent. Through mystical rites and rituals and trances and all kinds of stuff, this serpent uncoils itself in a spiraling way like DNA and ascends up the 33 bones of your spinal column to the cap, the top, the head, the position that Christ is. Christ is the head and we are the body. And so it ascends up the 33 bones of your spinal column to give mankind illumination. That's exactly what Langdon was portraying. In fact, he mentioned that it was just like Kundalini. Uh, Kundalini is one of those things that we're seeing creeping into the church right now. Church people, pastors giving people illumination by rituals and things like that. But here's what, I, here's what God showed me this morning. This is what made the doodads stand up, go up and down my back. Not like Kundalini. It was just amazing that I saw this. I was looking at a word, a word that I, you see frequently used in Freemasonry. Here's the symbol for the 33rd degree of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Notice the triangle, notice the double-headed eagle, that's the two kingdoms. Uh, notice the image of a crown, notice the number 33, and then notice that they have a, a slogan, Ordo Ab Ko. The Ordo part refers to order, a new world order. The Ab Ko means out of chaos, comes order. I looked up the word chaos this morning. Check it out. The etymology of the word chaos that we use all the time, you mean like confusion and tearing and, and on all these things, the word chaos comes from a Greek word, K-H-A-O-S, which is the word for the abyss, the pit, hell. Taken in its literal form, and remember, Masons always hide things in plain sight. Taken in its literal form, the phrase ordo ab chao literally means that a new world order is coming out of the pit. It's rising up to take over planet Earth. That's the religion of the beast in the last days. In all the studies that I've done on Freemasonry over the years, I can, I can kind of see these things now in different forms, things that are buried, whether underground or under a sea, always referring to the beast that's going to rise up in the last days. How about Atlantis? Atlantis is a lost city. It's been buried under the ocean. Remember Pharaoh and his kingdom? Buried underground. This is the kingdom that existed before the flood in the, last, in the, in the early days. It's a picture of the kingdom that's going to rise up, Atlantis rising. Remember, that's what uh, Francis Bacon wrote about uh, in his work, The New Atlantis. And that's what was, in his mind, epitomized this new world called America. So Atlantis is a picture of, of a beast kingdom buried under the sea and going to rise up in the last days. The Emerald Tablet of Thoth. Thoth is this king that was killed and is buried and this tablet of secret mysteries, the lost word of Freemasonry is buried with him and it's going to be revealed one of these days. The Alchemist Philosopher's Stone. If you've read Harry Potter, you know what that is. The Alchemist Philosopher's Stone, the Philosopher's Stone is buried underground. It's hidden away, it's secret, and it needs a key to unlock it. The Masonic character of Hiram Abiff. Hiram Abiff was murdered by three ruffians, was buried underground, acacia or thorns cover his grave, and he awaits a secret grip to bring him back to life or to raise him out of that pit or that grave in the last days. He needs a key. Osiris, the god, the Egyptian god who was murdered 
and body parts scattered all over the earth and buried and hidden and secreted away and he awaits resurrection in the last days. Hermes Trismegistus, which means thrice majestic. He is the great, he is a picture of this king in the former days who was killed, destroyed, buried by the flood and awaits resurrection in the last days. Here's something that when I found out about it, it just, I mean, it floored me. I've been doing uh, talks in this broadcast about the, uh, the ruler of Iran, uh, Ahmadinejad. Ahmadinejad is what's known as a Twelver. He belongs to a, like a secret society in Iran that is centered around this idea of the return of the Twelfth Imam Mahdi, the great exalted prophet, priest, king of the kingdom of Allah. I, you know, and, and, and Ahmadinejad was always talking about how he's going to bring in the kingdom of the Mahdi in the last days. And I'm going, this guy needs to be watched. I think he's scary. I think he's serious. And I had this concept, you know, that, you know, like um, Muhammad the prophet rose up into heaven, you know, was carried into heaven and all this stuff to be with Allah. So I had this idea that the 12th Imam Mahdi, the, the returning of him, he was going to come down from heaven. And by the way, they have this concept that says that the Imam Mahdi is going to return with Jesus, Isa. Uh, and Jesus is going to show up to all of us Christians and say, you idiots, you had it all wrong. You shouldn't believe that Bible. You should believe the Quran. Everybody needs to be a Muslim. That's what they say Jesus is going to do when he comes with the Imam Mahdi in the last days. So watch this. I thought that the Imam Mahdi was like going to float down from heaven and kill all the infidels and take over the world for Islam. Boy, was I wrong. I found out that the Imam Mahdi, there's a, there's a term that refers to him called the occultation, which means that currently the Imam Mahdi is hidden, occulted, buried. Guess where they say he is? He's in Jam Quran, Iran. Well, that's where Mahmud Ahmadinejad is. He's buried in a well. And here's a picture of the mosque that surrounds this well where their Savior is buried right now. And they're waiting for one day for something to happen that's going to trigger the release of the Mahdi, the Muslim um, the Muslim Messiah in the last days, he's going to rise up out of the KO, out of the chaos, out of the abyss, out of the pit. Let's see. Freemasons have this lost word buried in a pit. Muslims have their Messiah buried in a well, in a pit. I think they're worshiping the same God and they're promoting the same kingdom in the last days. Let me take this a step further. Be honest. Have you ever thrown money in a wishing well? I have. And believe it or not, I was watching, of all things, SpongeBob SquarePants. And Mr. Krabs, who's a money grubber, saw people throwing money into a well, and he's going, I've got to have a wishing well. And I'm just watching this imagery in a cartoon, and I'm thinking, I think there's something there because I know the, the Muslim Messiah is in a well. So I looked up wishing well. Go to Wikipedia and look up what a wishing well is. A wishing well is a term from European folklore to describe wells where it was thought that any spoken wish would be granted. That is what Dan Brown wrote, wrote about in the lost symbol, noetic, and here, I'll turn it around here. The noetic science referred to in here is this idea that our wishes, our thoughts become reality where it was thought that any spoken wish would be granted. The idea that a wish would be granted came from the idea that water housed deities or had been placed there as a gift from the gods since water was a source of life and often a scarce commodity. The Germanic and Celtic peoples considered springs and wells sacred places. Sometimes the places were marked with wooden statues, possibly of the god associated with the pool. Germanic peoples were known to throw the armor and weapons of defeated enemies into bogs and other pools of water as offerings unto their gods. You get it, don't you? 
This whole idea of a wishing well. In fact, what I'm finding out is that most of the myths, the superstitions, the traditions, they all have as its root this concept of a beast rising up in the last days or angels falling down from heaven to take over planet Earth in the last days. I'm going to show you this. i got one more thing to show you, and I'm going to show you this. Um, this is, I look for symbols. I look for things, I, and I'm getting halfway decent about spotting them. I was watching a movie here the other day. It came out a few years ago. It's called The Sum of All Fears. Now, this is interesting because the Bible refers to Lucifer in Exodus, or excuse me, Ezekiel chapter 28 as being the sum, the sum. Here we have a movie called The Sum of All Fears. And I wonder, I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of what this movie is all about. Here we have in this movie a conspiracy. A conspiracy to bring in a new world order. And this conspiracy is being facilitated by a secret society, a group meeting. And their main symbol is the swastika. Now, I will tell you, and you've seen some of our other stuff on that before, I will tell you that swastika doesn't just point you to the Nazis. The swastika is a hidden symbol showing the fusion of opposites together, up and down, left and right, being brought together. So the swastika is another hidden way of talking about these two kingdoms that are going to take over, or the sources of this kingdom that's going to take over planet Earth in the last days. So here we have a secret society that's going to facilitate the destruction of the old order and bringing in a new order, and their symbol is a swastika. The movie starts out by showing you a secret. The secret in this case is actually the destroyer, Abaddon. In this movie, it's symbolized by an atomic bomb that was buried underground. This atomic bomb is taken and sold on the black market and taken to Haifa, Israel. Haifa, Israel, and here's a picture of it on a map from Google Maps. Haifa is located between the 32nd and 33rd parallels. Now this bomb is shipped from Haifa to the Ukraine where it's uh, re reignited. It's then shipped from the Ukraine to Baltimore, Maryland, and it's going to be exploded and try to kill the president. And what they want to do is they want to start World War III. Are you ready for this one? The person who is in charge of bringing the hidden destroyer into this country to be detonated is a guy by the name of Mason. And his email address shows up as Mason dash J O D. The J O D is the Hebrew letter Yod, which is the first letter of the Tetragrammaton, which is Yod He Vahe, which is Jehovah, which is the name of God. Albert Pike, Manley Hall, all these Masonic writers, they talk about the letter Jod as having some special magical significance. Do you know why? Take a look at it. Because the letter Yod or Jod shows one part of it pointing up, one part of it pointing down. So the synopsis here is out of the chaos of the bomb comes a new order. And you see this at the end of the movie. Out of the chaos of the bomb, the destroyer buried, and it's revealed and it destroys, and then it brings these two kingdoms, Russia and America, back together in a new world order. I just had to share that this weekend. This is what God has shown me. Now here's what I'm going to say out of all of this that we've talked about. This, I believe that there is a plan afoot right now to destroy the old world and bring in a new world order. I believe it has everything to do with secret societies and secret happenings that are going on. I think that we're seeing it visually right in front of our very eyes in movies and books and even children's cartoons. And I will tell you that this plan is being worked on, activated as we speak. How can you escape this plan of the last days? I'm telling you that more people than think they are are either going to be killed in the last days or receive a mark on their right hand or forehead. What is the difference? What makes me or hopefully you so special? Let's go back to Revelation chapter 12. 
Verse 10 says, And I heard a voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. You remember the blood of the Lamb, don't you? You remember the, what the Passover was all about. The blood of the Lamb upon the doorpost prevented, here it is, the destroyer, Abaddon, Apollyon. It, it prevented, the blood of the Lamb prevented the destroyer for hurt, from hurting anyone in that house. Salvation is by the blood of the Lamb. Salvation of what is happening in these days is not going to be at the hands of Barack Obama or right now Massachusetts just elected its first Republican senator in 40 years. Never happened before for a long time. And as much as some people may like Scott Brown, he's not the savior of mankind. He's not the savior of America. Some people are watching conspiracy theories on TV or on the internet and they say, well, if we just band together, we can put a stop to this. It's not going to work. When this beast comes up, he's got power. And he is. In fact, this beast is even able to overcome the saints. Revelation chapter 13. What gives them then the power to overcome him? The blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And again, on this broadcast, I'm asking you today, are you saved? Are you born again? I'm not saying, do you believe in conspiracies? I'm saying, are you born again? Do you know for a fact that you have the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing away all of your sins and you have a new nature in you? You have a new spirit in you and everything that you want is for the kingdom of God to be on this earth. I'm asking you, are you born again? Get out your Bible. Read it. Study it. And ask God. Don't ask me and don't let me confer you this idea that you're saved. You ask God, God, am I saved? Am I born again? If I died today, where would I spend eternity? And God, I want you to show me the answer right here in the pages of this book. I've enjoyed bringing this to you. I had this in me this morning and I just had to get it out. And boy, I'm glad I did. I hope you've enjoyed this week's Watchman video broadcast. Continue to pray for our ministry because I will tell you, I'm giving this out as a result of probably one of the worst weeks that I've ever spent in my life. There has been a spiritual attack on me in this ministry and in this church uh, all week long. Some of you know about this. I have been, I mean, there's a spirit that was just beating me to death this week. And God finally relieved me of that all to show me what I just showed you today about where the chaos is or where the new order is coming from. And I want you to pray for this ministry. I want you to pray for this broadcast. I want you to pray that God will continue to use me or anybody else for that matter who loves the King James Bible to reveal things to people in the last days. Pray for us. I appreciate the emails. appreciate the comments. If you're watching us for the very first time, I hope you've enjoyed your first taste of the Watchman video broadcast. We have lots of other stuff like this waiting for you. Remember to get in contact with us. You can call our office or you can just email me and say, I saw that, Brother Mike. Wow. We're praying for you. If you want to be on our watchers list, just send us an email. Uh, send us a letter. Uh, call us. Call our office and say, we want to be put on the watchers list. You'll get all of these. You'll get this. You'll get this on a special DVD this month. And I want you to take this and I want you to copy it like crazy and pass it around to people so they can see what's going on in these last days. Anyway, get on our watchers list. We just ask for a donation of any amount to help cover our cost. If you don't have anything, we won't turn you down. But please remember to pray for us and help us if you can. I love you. And I appreciate you praying for me, and I appreciate the fact that you love me. And I've never met most of you, but I want you to know I love you, and I pray for you. This is Pastor Mike. I'm going to go eat lunch now. Bye-bye.